The Seven Folds, as found in the Red Fairy Book. <clears throat> the once upon a time was a couple of poor folks who lived in a wretched hut, far away from everyone else, in a wood. They only just managed to live from hand to mouth, and had great difficulty in doing even so much as that. But they had three sons, and the youngest of them was called Ashlad, for he did nothing but lie and poke among the ashes. One day the eldest lad said that he would go out to earn his living. He soon got leave to do that, and set out on his way into the wide world. He walked on and on for a whole day, and when night was beginning to fall, he came to a royal palace. The king was standing outside the steps and asked where he was going. Oh, I'm going about seeking a place, my father, said the youth. Wilt thou serve me and watch my seven foals? said the king. If thou canst watch them for the whole day, and tell me at night what they eat and drink, thou shalt have the princess, and half my kingdom. But if thou canst... If thou canst not, I will cut three red stripes on thy back. Okay. Do you th thought that it was an easy work to watch the foals, and that he would do very well. Clearly, he has never watched foals before. Next morning, when the day was beginning to dawn, the king's master of the horse led out to the seven foals, and they ran away. And the youth after them, just as it chanced over a hill and dale, through the woods and bogs. When the youth had run thus for a long time, he began to get tired. And when he had held a little longer, he was hardly wary of watching them all. And at the same moment, he came to a cleft in the rock, where an old woman was sitting, spinning with her distaff in her hand. As soon as she caught sight of the youth who was running after the fool, was till the perspiration streamed down his face. She cried, Come hither, come hither, my handsome son. Let me comb your hair for you. <clears throat> the lad was willing enough, and he sat down in the cleft of the rock beside the old hag, and laid his head on her knees. And she combed his hair all day while he lay there, and gave himself up to idleness. When evening was drawing near, the youth wanted to go. I may just as well go straight home again, he said, for it is no use to go to the king's palace. Wait till it is dusk, said the old hag, and then the king's foals will pass by this place again, and you can run home with them, and no one will ever know you've been lying here all day instead of watching the foals, like you're supposed to. So when they came, he gave the... She gave the lad a bottle of water and a bit of moss, and told him to show these to the king and say, This is what the seven foals ate and drank. Hast thou watched faithfully as well as the whole day long? said the king, his accent changed. When the lad came into his presence in the evening, Yes, that I have, said the youth. Then you are able to tell me what it is that my seven fools eat and drink, said the king. He's a stable master now. So the youth produced the bottle of water and the bit of moss which he had gotten from the old woman, saying, Here you see their meat, and here you see their drink. Then the king knew how his watching had been done. 
and fell into such a rage that he ordered the people to chase the youth back to his own home at once. But first they were to cut three red stripes in his back and rub salt into them. Ow. <clears throat> Friends come on. When the youth reached home, again, can any, you can imagine the state that he was in. He had, he had gone out to seek a place, he said, but never would he do such a thing again. The next day, the second son that he would go out now into the world and seek his fortune. His mother and father said, No! and bade him to look at his brother's back. But the youth would not give up his design, and stuck to it. And after a long, long time, he got his leave to go, and set forth on his way. When he had walked all day, he too came to the king's palace. And the king was standing outside on the steps, and asked him where he was going. And when the youth replied that he was going about in search of a place, the king said that he might enter into his service and watch his seven folds. Then the king promised him the same punishment, and the same reward, that he had offered his brother. The youth at once consented to this, and entered the king's service for he thought he could easily watch the fools and inform the king what they ate and drank. In the gray light of dawn, the master of the horse let out the seven fools, and off they went again over hill and dale, and off went the lad after them. But all went with him as it had gone with his brother. When he had run after the fools for a long, long time, he was hot and tired. He passed by a cleft in the rock where an old woman was sitting, spinning with a distaff, and she called to him. Come hither, come hither, my handsome son, and let me comb your hair. She's got a thing about hair. The youth liked this thought, and he let the foals run where they chose, and seated himself in the cleft of the rock by the side of the old hag. So there he sat with his head on her lap, taking his ease all live long day. The foals came back in the evening, and then he too got a bit of moss and a bottle of water from the old hag, which things he was to show to the king. But when the king asked the youth, Canst thou tell me what my seven foals ate and drink? And the youth showed him the bit of moss and the bottle of water, and said, Yes, here you may behold their meat, and hear their drink. The king once more became wroth, and commanded that three red stripes be cut into the lad's back, and salt should be strewn upon them, and that he should be instantly chased back to his own house. So, when the youth got home again, he too related all that happened to him, and he too said that he had gone out in search of a place once, but that never would he do it again. Now, on the third day, Cinderlad, excuse me, Ashlad, wanted to set out. He had a fancy to try what, to watch the seven folds for himself, and he said, <laughs> The other two laughed at him and mocked him, as usual. What? When all went so well for us, do you suppose that you are going to succeed? You look like... <laughs> you, 
You look like succeeding. <laughs> you who have never done anything else but lie and poke about among the ashes, they said. Yes, I will go too, said Ashlad, for I have taken it into my head. The two brothers laughed at him, and his father and mother begged him not to go, but to, oh, to no purpose. And Ashlad set out on his way. So when he had walked the whole day, he too came to the king's palace, and the darkness began to fall. There stood the king outside on the steps, and asked whether he was to be bound. I'm walking about in the search of a place, Ashled said. From whence do you come, then? inquired the king. For by this time he wanted to know a little bit more about the men before he would take any of them into his service. Job interviews. So Ashlad told him whence he came, and that he was the brother of the two who had watched the seven folds for the king. And then he inquired if he might be allowed to try to watch them on the following day. Oh, shame on them, said the king, for it enraged him to even think of them. If thou art brother to those two, thou art not good for much. I have had enough of such fellows. But, as I have come here, you might as well give me leave to make an attempt. Oh, very well. If thou art absolutely determined to have thy back flayed, thou mayst have thine own way if thou wilt. I would much rather have the princess, said Ashland. <laughs> mm. Next morning, in the gray light of dawn, the master of the horse let out the seven foals again, and off they set over hill and dale, through woods and bogs, and off went Ashland after them. When he had run thus for a long time, he too came to the cleft in the rock. There the old hag was once more sitting, spinning from her distaff, and she cried to Cinderlad, Come hither, come hither, my handsome son, and let me comb your hair for you. Come to me, then, come to me, said Ashlad, as he passed by jumping and running, and keeping tight hold of one of the four tails. When he had got safely past the cleft in the rock, the youngest wolf said, Get on my back, for we still have a long way to go. So the lad did this, and thus they journeyed on a long, long way. Dost thou see anything now? said the fool. No, said Ashlad. So they journeyed onwards a good bit further. Dost thou see anything now? asked the fool. Oh, no, said the ash lad. When they had gone thus for a long, long way, the fool again asked, Dost thou see anything now? Yes, now I see something that is white, said ash lad. It looks just like a trunk of a great thick birch tree. Yes, that is where we are to go in, said the fool. When they got to the trunk, the eldest foal broke it down on one side, and then they saw a door where the trunk had been standing, and inside this was a small room, and in the room there was scarcely anything but a small fireplace, a couple of benches, but behind the door hung a great rusty sword, and a small pitcher. Ouch. <clears throat> Canst thou wield that sword? asked the fool. Ashlad tried, but could not do it, and so he had to draught from the pitcher, and then one more, and after that still another, and then he was able to wield the sword, 
with perfect ease. Good, said the fool. And now thou must take the sword away with thee, and it, with it shalt cut off the heads of all seven of us on thy wedding day. And then we shall become princes again as we were before. For we are brothers of the princess whom thou art to have as when thou canst tell the king what we eat and drink. But there is a mighty troll who has cast a spell over us. Once thou hast cut off our heads, thou must make the greatest care to lay each at the tail of the body to which it belonged. And then the spell which the troll cast upon us shall lose all of its power. Ashlad promised to do this, and then they went on further. When they had traveled a long, long way, the fool said, Dost thou see anything? No, said Ashlad. Then they went on a great distance further. And now? inquired the fool. Seest thou nothing now? Alas, no, said Cinderlad. So they traveled. Um, so they traveled onwards again, after many and many a mile over hill and dale. Now then, said the fool, dost thou see anything now? Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Yes, said Ashlad. Now I see something like a bluish streak, far, far away. It is a river, said the fool, and we have come to cross it. There was a long, handsome bridge over the river, and when they had got to the other side of it, they again traveled a long, long way. And then once more the fool inquired of Ashlad if he saw anything. And this time he saw something that looked black, far, far away, and was rather like a church tower. Yes, said the fool. We shall go into that. When the fool was gotten to the churchyard, they turned into men and looked like the sons of a king, and their clothes were so magnificent that they shone with splendor. And they went into the church and received bread and wine from the priest, who was standing before the altar. And Ashlad went in too. But when the priest had laid his hands on the princes and read the blessing, they went out of the church again, and Cinderlad went out too. But he took with him a flask of wine and some consecrated bread. No sooner had the seven princes come out of the churchyard that they became foals again. And Cinderlad got upon the black back of the youngest, and they returned by the way which they had come. Only they went much, much faster. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. First they went over the bridge, and then past the trunk of the birch tree. Then past the old hag who sat in the cleft in the rock spinning. And they went by so fast that Ashlad could not hear what the old hag screeched after him. But just heard enough to understand that she was terribly enraged. It was all but dark when they got back to the king at nightfall, and he himself was standing in the courtyard awaiting them. Hast thou watched well and faithfully the whole day, said the king to St. Ashlad. I have done my best, replied Ashlad. Then thou canst tell me what my seven foals eat and drink, asked the king. So Ashlad pulled out the consecrated bread and the flask of wine and showed them to the king. Here he may behold their meats and hear their drink. Yes, diligently and faithfully thou hast watched, said the king, and thou shalt have the princess and half the kingdom. So all was made ready for the wedding, and the king said that it was to be so stately and magnificent that everyone should hear of it, and everyone inquired about it. But when they sat down to the marriage feast, the bridegroom arose and went down to the stable, for he said that he had forgotten something. 
which he must go and look to. When he got there, he did what the foals had bid him, and cut off the heads of all seven. First the oldest, then the second, and so on and so on, according to their age. And he was extremely careful to lay each head at the tail of the foal which had belonged. And when that was done, all the foals became princes. And the king was so joyful that he kissed Ashlad and clapped him on the back. And his bride was still more delighted with him than she had been before. Half my kingdom is thine already, said the king, and the other half shall be thine after my death, for my sons can get countries and kingdoms for themselves now that they've become princes again. Therefore, as all may well believe, there was joyments and merriments at the wedding. 